Welcome to Fantastic History. I'm Sarah. And I'm Clay. We're a husband and wife duo who enjoy telling each other about amazing events, people, and mysteries throughout history. So much of what we're taught in school um, is history as it relates to war. Like just, you know, various war times. That's true. I feel like that tends to be kind of the the markers that they use. Um, so I'm trying to make my war related stories, like try to spread them out a little bit. Okay. So that we're not constantly talking about it. I mean, first of all, because like, it's not even like that interesting a lot of the time. Like, but then also because that's probably you've already, you know, you Clay and, you know, everybody listening, like, because that's kind of what was focused on in school. You've already heard a lot of it. Definitely the highlights. Right. So here's the thing, though, because every now and then I come across something that rules so much that I simply have to talk about it. Okay. And uh, that's the situation we presently find ourselves in. Okay. So today I want to tell you about an extraordinary soldier who served in the Continental Army during the Revolutionary War. Okay. So to my surprise and delight, uh, even though I've had this person on my list for a while, I didn't realize until I started this research that this is also another Massachusetts story. So we hear Oh, we need like a, a um, we need a musical theme. We, a, a we little need trigger. a sweet Caroline. The... It needs to be like less than three seconds so we don't get content ID matched. Oh, that's a good point. So just the bum, bum, bum. Yeah, that'll work. That. Okay. Um, so Robert Shirtleff was born in Plimpton, Massachusetts in December of 1760 to parents Jonathan and Deborah, who were both direct descendants of Mayflower passengers. Robert uh, was number five in a lineup of seven kids, which ended up being a little bit too much for Jonathan to handle, I guess, because although his kids were told he died in a shipwreck, he actually ran away to Maine and started a whole new life with a whole new family that only had two kids in it. Wow. Yikes. Uh, Big yikes on Jonathan. Yeah, no kidding. Not cool. Uh, So even though Robert's family had such a notable background, they never had very much money. And of course, the situation became exponentially worse when there was no longer a dad in the picture. Mm -hmm. Because, I mean, again, it's the 1700s. Best of luck to you. The kids were all sent away to live in different households, which was a pretty common practice at the time if you couldn't afford to feed your kids, but you knew people who could. So Robert ended up with one of his mom's relatives for a while. But when his mom died about five years later, um, the relatives passed him off to an elderly widow. And then when she died, he became an indentured servant for a large family in Middleborough, which is the next town over from where Melanie lives. Yay. Okay. So Robert was 11 years old at that point. And that is so young to be living so rough. Like, life has already handed him a lot to deal with in those 11 years. Like, yeah, dad dies in a shipwreck. Mm -hmm. You get split up from your brothers and sisters. Then your mom dies. Then the people you're living with are like, oh, she's dead, so leave. You get sent to this old lady. The old lady dies, and now you're an indentured servant? Like, good lord. It's it's a pretty tragic tale. It's a so bummer. Far. Yeah, it's like the American version of uh, Great Expectations or something. Yeah, crazy. So while indentured to the Thomas family of Middleborough, Robert was not allowed to attend school. But the family's children actually shared their schoolwork with him. So in a roundabout way, he ended up getting a really good education despite his circumstances. When he turned eighteen and was freed from his contract, he made a living as a private tutor a weaver, and a bartender. Hmm. He was also a skilled carpenter who could make everything from thread spools to wooden tools to sleds. So a little bit of everything, like small projects-wise. Right, okay. But listen, there's a pretty big war going on by this point. Robert was only 15 when the relationship between England and the American colonies turned sour, so of course participating was out of the question at that point. But with every year that went by without a resolution, he was more and more certain that he needed to fight. In the spring of 1782, he traveled to West Point in New York and officially enlisted in the 4th Massachusetts Regiment, where he was assigned to Captain George Webb's Company of Light Infantry. Okay. So, 
I kind of the the name Company of Light Infantry mm-hmm. kind of gave me the impression of like you're kind of second string. Like a little bit just oh light infantry, like just something in that phrasing made me think like Well when you when you got heavy and when you got heavy versus light, it does indicate that, but it certainly doesn't mean that in practicality. Uh, no, it does not, because this was kind of an elite squad of about sixty soldiers. Ooh, elite. Yeah. So in order to be assigned as light infantry, you had to be taller and stronger than the average soldier, which Robert was. Okay. Uh, these were the dudes who showed up when you needed to call in the big guns. Like these were the <laughs> boss bitches, right? Yeah. They provided reinforcements. They acted as rear guards for advancing troops, and they were called on to do reconnaissance work when there was a greater chance of being caught and needing to fight your way out. Hmm. So it's it, they're almost like the SEAL team. Like special forces. Yes, exactly. That's okay. exactly it. So even though he'd been making his way in the world as a teacher and a carpenter up to this point, Robert was a total badass, perfectly suited to light infantry duty. And he was quickly assigned to the borderline suicidal role of scouting in neutral territory. You see, the British were starting to amass troops and supplies in Manhattan, and a little fellow named George Washington was considering an attack on this stronghold they were building. (laughs) So I would like to invite you at this point to uh, pause this episode. You have to promise to come back, but pause this episode and listen to Right Hand Man from Hamilton. Okay, and then scooch back over to hear the rest of the story. I think it'll really kind of set the tone. And I'm not just saying that because it's my favorite song from Hamilton that doesn't (laughs) have Thomas Jefferson or King George. (laughs) It's just so good. That song makes my eyes water every single time. Like it makes me like I feel scared when I listen to that song. So I just feel like just to give you an idea of like this was a very frightening situation to be in. Yeah. And especially like leading up to it when you're just like scouting and trying to figure out where things are. Like you don't have the whole army behind you. Like very, very scary situation. But it's actually kind of funny because Robert's early life reminds me of Alexander Hamilton, right? Like his dad runs off, his mom dies And so our hero gets passed around taking odd jobs and educating himself while his caretakers just die. Yeah. Isn't that weird? Yeah. Like very similar background. Well, I was thinking that when you first mentioned it, but I didn't want to bring up (laughs) Hamilton again. No, we should talk about Hamilton in every episode. And if y'all don't like Hamilton, then just like, what is wrong with you? You, (laughs) uh, this is a history podcast. Obviously we're going to talk about Hamilton. If if you, if you do, not like Hamilton, uh, please like and subscribe with a five star <laughs> rating. And if you do like Hamilton, please like and subscribe with a five star rating. Yeah, leave us a comment about how much you freaking love Hamilton. I it doesn't matter what your comment says as long as you're leaving us a five star review. We're happy with it. So just uh, <laughs> that's true. Yeah. Any anyway, so like only a month after joining the army, um, Robert was put with about thirty other infantrymen from you know, the light the light guys um, and infiltrating that neutral territory outside of Manhattan so they could gather the intel. So this sometimes involved raiding the homes of British sympathizers who were thought to have information. And sometimes Robert even had to engage in hand to hand combat. Mm. So this is already a very precarious situation. But then a full on battle broke out on July 3rd. So he's only been in for like a month, less than a month. Um, Well, no, I guess a little bit over a month, a little bit over a month um, by July. So, yikes. He was shot twice in the thigh and took a sword blade to the face. Oh, no. Which is crazy. But he basically the Black Knight from Monty Python, the whole thing, you know, like it's only (laughs) a flesh wound. He what, ended, wh- where was this during these raids or was this, this was just... during the battle that broke out on July 3rd? Okay. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> so so he's he just the middle of it. Yes. Yeah. Like just, you know, kind of everybody's getting wounded. Everybody's getting shot at and have swords swung at them and whatever. Jeez. Yeah. So like he was kind of just wanting to, to press on and, and not be bothered with it. But he did end up agreeing to have his head tended and bandaged by a doctor in a field hospital. Hmm. However, he was not willing to wait around long enough to have his leg tended to. So he did it himself. Oh. 
He was able to remove one of the musket balls by digging around in the wound with a sewing needle and a pen knife. Oh, my God. Yeah. And he he has no antiseptic, no kind of pain medicine. Like, this is the Revolutionary War. But the other musket ball was destined to stay right where it was for the rest of his life. Mm. Which, of course, meant that that, like, never fully healed. Probably not. Yeah. Oh, definitely not. I, I, it was it was a problem for the rest of his life. You leave something like that inside, and it's going to be a problem for sure. You leave something like that, and you were digging around in your own leg with a sewing needle and a pen knife without any kind of like this man doesn't even have neosporin. Like, what are you doing? <laughs> Crazy. So it was going to be a while before he was ready for active duty again. After all that, so Robert volunteered to look after another soldier. Richard Snow, who was also very badly injured during the battle. So they were going to kind of hang back until they were both ready to go back out there. They were quartered in the house of a man named Abraham Van Tassel, which I love that name, but he sucks. Oh. uh, Because he was a British sympathizer. Right. Gross. Um, That was just kind of a thing that happened back then. No matter what side you were on, if they told you you're going to be housing some soldiers... You're going to be housing some soldiers and nobody cares if any of you like it. You or the soldiers don't care. This is where you're staying. You're just a pawn. Exactly. Yeah. Everyone involved, you know, if George Washington said this guy is staying in this house. What are you going to do? Yeah, right. Hmm. Now, because Abraham was not team freedom, he forced Robert and Richard to stay up in the attic of his house where there was no airflow whatsoever, even though it was July. Mm. It was brutal. So it's probably not too surprising that Richard died because of the conditions. He just, yeah, not good. And especially you got to figure if you're wounded, you're in this like muggy room like that is a breeding ground. Yeah, for sure. Awful. Awful. Robert, understandably, did not take this very well. Pretty much as soon as he was back in fighting shape, he led a night raid on the Van Tassel home with the help of one of Abraham's own daughters. And captured 15 British sympathizers, including Abraham Van Tassel. Wow. Yeah. Big middle finger to this guy. Like, you killed my friend. This aggression will not stand, man. (laughs) When Robert returned to active duty officially, he received a promotion for all of his heroic deeds and was assigned a much cushier job as right-hand man to General John Patterson which is pretty good work if you can get it because for the most part, generals weren't actually seeing frontline action. Yeah. Uh, This is where Robert and Hamilton really differ though, because Robert was never out to make a name for himself as some big hero. Being remembered was never a goal of his. Uh, Pretty funny since we're doing an episode about him, Um, but he, (laughs) he was just doing his patriotic duty. Like that was the entire goal for him. So even though he's this big buff dude, he's perfectly happy to serve his country by serving the general. Totally fine with it. He kept his hands relatively clean until June of 1783, when rumblings about an uprising in Philadelphia reached George Washington's ears. A lot of soldiers were understandably upset about a delay in their pay, and they were threatening to take drastic action. I, I do this thing now where when I'm researching, I just kind of let my imagination do whatever it wants. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> oh, yeah. So in this scene in my fan fiction, which this is at least the third episode where I've talked about my <laughs> fan fiction that I'm going to write about the history. But so in this scene, like I'm imagining a soldier. He's in like full revolutionary uniform that's all dirty. He's got like a wooden crutch under one arm. He's bloody from battle. He's probably got like a bandage wrapped around his head or something so he walks up to independence hall with a bunch of his buddies like flanking him for moral support and he holds this huge 80s style boom box over his head and starts blasting um bitch better have my money by rihanna okay so i, f- I feel like that's kind of how this was going down this feels like it would it would be perfect for an episode of riverdale <laughs> so rude what why are you so rude to me also you don't know anything about riverdale i know a lot about riverdale you know nothing to be fair neither of us does i only know what i see on buzzfeed when i'm bored so. if you have any feelings for or against riverdale <laughs> please stop it as soon as they send big bad bobby shirt down a deal with the boys to quash this rebellion you know it's getting quashed what was his name Robert Shirtleff, but I'm calling him Big Bad Bobby. 
Oh, I thought this was a new character. <laughs> no, this is this is our main character, and I've just I've gotten too I've gone too far down the rabbit hole, like pre writing this fan fiction. You are you are quite familiar <laughs> with him at this point. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah, I've I've seen it all, man. So unfortunately, though, so he he goes down there to quash it. Problem is, there is also an epidemic sweeping through Philly at this time. Mm. And Robert got so sick while refusing to leave his post to see a doctor that he ended up passing out from his fever and being taken to the nearby home of Dr. Barnabas Benny, which was one of the most made up sounding names I've ever heard in my life. Yeah, it re- yeah, that's perfect. Barnabas Benny. It's like, hey, who were you hanging out with last night? Oh, his name is Barnabas Benny. What was his last name? Benny. Benny. Barnabas Benny. Yeah, it's ter- that's a terrible name. Well, here's the thing, though, honey. Dr. Benny was not the only one who had a made-up name. Oh. Because so did Robert Shirtleff. What? Whose birth name was Deborah Sampson. What? Deborah had her Mulan moment when the doctor removed her uniform as part of the treatment for her fever and discovered the linen fabric she had been using to bind her breasts for the last 17 months. Whoa! Big Bad Bobby was actually a boss-ass bitch this entire time and nobody has suspected a thing. That is... Wow, what a twist! Yeah. Yelp. We haven't had a twist like that (laughs) since that darn duck <laughs> that turned out to be a girl duck i was thinking about that the whole time yep i was like i can't believe we're doing another like mulan war story <laughs> that's crazy yeah wow yeah so please allow me to remind you that she qualified for light infantry because she was taller and stronger than the vast majority of other soldiers She was also later described by friends and family as having a thick waist, narrow hips, and small breasts. A friend of hers and her personal biographer, Herman Mann, described her by saying, quote, The features of her face are regular, but not what a physiognomicist would term the most beautiful. So I'll post a sketch of her that was done at the time, and you'll probably be able to tell where he was going you know going with that she was not ugly but her facial features weren't what would have been considered feminine at the time she passed she passed as a man exactly very easily Hmm. as far as my research shows nobody she served with ever suspected a thing that's so interesting Mm -hmm. i mean obviously she passed oh yeah (laughs) yeah but um but no one ever suspected nope in all that time 17 months in the army with the boys. In the army with the boys, like in battle, you know, getting wounded. That's why she didn't want the doctor to look at her leg because she'd have oh, to take her pants down. Oh, yeah. But like showering. Well, I mean, that was, a whole, that was a whole different situation back then because, and this is something, there were several women who served in the Civil War and I've looked quite a lot into that. Uh-huh. But like people of every sex were both like they were very private you like it's not like today where there's a locker room and guys are like hey look at your little penis like there is none of that going on you know like it was people were very private very modest okay so she had that going for her yeah dr benny was a real one because he did not immediately inform the army of his discovery Instead, he offered Deborah a place to stay and recuperate in his own home, where she was tended by his wife and daughters, as well as one of his nurses, all of whom kept her secret. Mm. She stayed with them until the Treaty of Paris was signed, and a date was announced for the American soldiers to muster out in November of 1783. At that time, Dr. Benny wrote a letter to General Patterson detailing his findings about Private Robert Shirtliff and gave it to Deborah to deliver in person. Mm. When she did, instead of getting her into trouble, General Patterson thanked her for her service, signed her discharge papers, and gave her the money she would need for the return trip home. She was honorably discharged. Okay. So, though her home church retracted her membership and its members refused to have anything to do with her when her, heavy air quotes here, deception 
was found out. Mm -hmm. Deborah Sampson faced no real social consequences for enlisting in the army and fighting to free America from British oppression. Well, that's really great because... So unexpected. Yeah. Right? Like, that's crazy. It's pretty unexpected, but also, like, I don't know. Is it a bit... is, is it a bit ignorant to think that at the time they may have had bigger issues to consider like then? Well, the war was over. Well, that's true. Um, and so, you know, yeah, there are always bigger issues to consider than what's between somebody's legs. But people are still losing their minds about it to this day. Exactly. So what do you know? Uh, just as a sidebar, if you care about somebody else's genitals, you're the weirdo. Mind your own business. Yeah. Moving on. She settled down in the years following the war, marrying a farmer named Benjamin Gannett and having four children. In 1792, she petitioned the Massachusetts state legislature for the military pay that had been withheld from her when her sex was revealed. And it was approved by Governor John Hancock that she received 34 pounds plus nine years interest. Ooh. Yeah, not bad. Yeah. She continued to have money trouble, though, in part because the Gannett land had been overworked and was struggling to produce crops. To bring in some cash, she agreed to let Herman Mann write that biography I mentioned earlier, and it was published in 1797. A few years later, she went on a cross-country lecture tour and did just about the most iconic thing I have ever heard of in my life. So she'd get up on the stage and give this long, impassioned speech about the importance of women maintaining traditional gender roles. Then she went off stage, changed into her whole ass Revolutionary War soldier hero uniform and came back onto the stage to perform military drills that were described by attendees as being complicated and physically demanding. Nice. Yeah. Love it. She did the old switcheroo. Yeah. And I'm obsessed with her. <laughs> but even with ticket sales and the royalties from her biography, Deborah and Benjamin continued to struggle financially. So she reached out to her close personal friend, Paul Revere, and asked him to write to the government on her behalf to request she receive a military pension reflective of her service and the wounds she had suffered in battle. This was the first time anyone had ever even considered suggesting that a woman be paid a military pension. Mm. But, you know, Mr. Revere was kind of a big deal. And he was pretty persuasive in his arguments. <laughs> so Congress approved her to begin receiving a monthly pension in March of 1805. But it wasn't as much as they were paying to all the other men she had served with. And it also wasn't prorated to her discharge in 1783. Mm. She was back and forth between Congress several times until she attained ultimate victory in 1816. And hell yeah, that included the 33 years of back pay. Oh, man. But but it took such a long time. 33 years she was trying to get this money. Wow. Uh Uh-huh. But hey, with that, she was finally able to get out of debt and they were able to get the farm up and running again. So no more money problems. Man. I know. After her death from yellow fever in 1827, her husband was back in front of Congress again to petition for the spousal pension that was due to him as a military spouse. While his petition was eventually approved, Benjamin passed away before that first payout came. Uh, I know. The unimaginable courage and determination of Deborah Sampson will never be forgotten. Even if it's not talked about that much anymore, there's still like she is still a huge deal to the people who know about her. And you can totally see why there are monuments to her in her birthplace of Plimpton, Massachusetts, as well as in Sharon, where the Gannett family farm was located. Not only that, she was named the official heroine of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts in 1983, and she was awarded the prestigious Commemorative Medal by the United States Capitol Historical Society in 1985. Perhaps even cooler, she features in a season five episode of one of my favorite TV shows of all time, Drunk History. (laughs) Yeah. If that story doesn't make you feel patriotic, nothing ever will. (laughs) Come on, guys. That is incredible. I am obsessed 
obsessed with the story and i'm so glad <laughs> that you were completely surprised by the i reveal. was i was waiting for like i was waiting for the something something important to happen because because at first it was like okay this is interesting yeah but it's not like it's not gonna yeah make me uh it's not like gonna keep me up yeah it's, and it, it. it's not like dedicate a week to research interesting yeah. necessarily that was like that was, that was done very well thank you and uh, hey, thanks to you guys uh, for listening. Um, if you were cash money enough not to turn it off when I mentioned that trans rights matter. Um, so, hey, appreciate that. Appreciate you. Hopefully you enjoyed that story. And if you did, please take a second to rate, review and subscribe on whatever podcast platform you use. You can also check us out on Instagram and Twitter at Fantastic H Pod. And I'll post a couple of sketches of Deborah. Obviously, there were not pictures back then. Um, you can drop us a line at fantastichistorypod at gmail.com if you know of any amazing events, people, and mysteries throughout history that you'd like us to cover on the show, or if you just want to say hi. See you next week. Later. Later.